Lewis. Uh, I'm a local designer here. I live in Cambridge. Um, I'm a design engineer at Automatic, um, working on WordPress.com. I'm also a WordPress core contributor. Um, I contribute to the UI team. And you can find me online at all of these various places. Uh, so I really just want to preface this talk um, by mentioning that trends really, when it, when it comes to Adwit, they're just tools. So trends aren't necessarily inherently good or bad, uh, they're just part of a designer's toolkit. So what really would make a, a, you know, a trend bad uh, is if you overuse it, if you use it inappropriately, um, or if just, you know, everyone else is doing it, so my site needs to do it too. So if you're relying on a trend, uh, it should be because that trend is appropriate for whatever site you're building at the time. So let's kick things off uh, with an overall look at how uh, WordPress is currently doing in the industry. Uh, so more and more, uh, we're seeing that WordPress can pretty much do anything that you throw at it. Uh, it powers 24% of the internet, which is massive. It beats out every other single content management system by everything, like all combined. It's, it's pretty insane. And uh, we're seeing WordPress being used more and more for a variety of different kinds of sites. Uh, for example, uh, a lot of big names uh, in the tech industry, in business, uh, are actually using it to power off some of their like one-off microsites. Uh, so like about.me, uh, they have uh, this site, uh, Campus, I guess, uh, I think it's like education related. Uh, Facebook actually uses a ton uh, of WordPress sites for like all their little events, um, any, any kind of like one-off thing they want to do. Uh, for example, here's their instant article site uh, for the new uh, article feature that they just released. Uh, Quartz, uh, big media company, they use WordPress uh, for their site, but also for a lot of these uh, small one-off event sites. Time, uh, even Red Hat uh, all use WordPress. It's also the leading choice for tech blogs. Uh, Microsoft actually runs its blogs on WordPress, pretty cool. Flickr, Dropbox, they have a, they have a bunch of blogs that are all in WordPress. Uh, even Adobe Typekit. Uh, and once again, Facebook. It's pretty cool that like all these really big name sites, they're like, yeah, we build our own platforms, but we're gonna use WordPress. WordPress is pretty cool. It also totally dominates news and big media. Uh, WordPress is run by sites like The New Yorker, uh, Quartz, 538, uh, which I think is done by Tenup. I don't know if there's any Tenup people in the room. Awesome. TechCrunch, uh, and CNN. So lots of big names up there. Uh, you can also find WordPress being used in enterprise, uh, like Disney, uh, and Sony Music. And of course, uh, everyone's favorite celebrities like Beyonce uh, and Snoop Dogg. <laughs> so I think most interestingly, uh, WordPress has started entering the app market. More and more people are using WordPress to actually power uh, their mobile and web apps. So the new WordPress API is being used to power uh, mobile apps for clients. Uh, or you can use a service like AppPressor uh, to convert your WordPress website into a mobile app. So you can actually turn your site into an app. So really cool if you have like an e-commerce site or you know anything that you want to be like totally mobile. So what does the future uh, of the WordPress industry look like? Um, you've, you've all probably heard a lot about the API this weekend. I feel like it's been brought up a couple times. Uh, but I think the API is going to be a total game changer. We're going to be seeing more and more of people using the WordPress API uh, to power new, exciting sites for clients, for their own businesses, uh, for apps. And I think as designers, uh, a lot of us are going to need to step up our games and stretch our abilities to like new heights. So if you're used to designing for websites and now all of a sudden you have a lot of clients coming to you and you're like, man, you know, I want to build this app using WordPress, or maybe they're just like, I want to build this app, and you're like, you should use WordPress, you know, as, as we do. Um, we're going to have to start thinking about new things like interaction design, uh, really important on mobile, um, just a lot of new UI concepts that maybe as web designers we haven't been thinking about as much. So I think in the next year, 
we're going to see a lot of the boundaries of WordPress being pushed uh, faster than they've been before. So kind of a good example of this uh, is WordPress.com. Uh, it's currently being built from the ground up, rebuilt, uh, using React.js. So many of the pages uh, that you've seen on WordPress.com today are totally API-driven. Uh, pretty cool. A lot of our new, our new staff interface, new, um, like pages and post lists, etc. So, um, from, let's get to the fun stuff uh, for me, uh, which is visual, uh, visual trends. Uh, as designers, this is kind of you know what gets us really excited to go to work and like do fun things. So, as WordPress continues to power more and more of the internet. Um, and as the community grows, I'm seeing us syncing up faster with industry trends. So in the past, I think we've, we've been a little bit behind in terms of following uh, industry design trends, industry tech trends. Um, so I, I would say that like previously, we had been maybe like 9 to 12 months behind, um, like breaking new trends. But I'm seeing that gap being closed faster and faster. And now, honestly, I think we're in, in more of like a 3 to 6 months, uh, maybe a little bit more. But we're syncing up with like the overall tech industry just a little bit faster. You know, in the industry as a whole, we're seeing a big standardization of design patterns. Uh, probably the coolest new kid on the block is Google's material design. It's a design language characterized by its metaphor-driven use of layers and depth, uh, its bold graphic visual treatment, uh, and its very intentional use of realistic motion. So you can see it in use uh, in pretty much all of Google's main products on both mobile, uh, mobile and the web, along with uh, an increasing number of third-party Android apps. So you're, you're seeing a lot more of this all over the web. So predating material design, almost like an inspiration, it's flat. It was super hot last year, with all the rage. Uh, and it's kind of a predecessor to both um, the, the visual language that Apple's been developing recently, um, since like iOS what, 6 or 7 or whatever. Uh, and Google's material design. Uh, so it's characterized, again, uh, by bold, solid color palettes, uh, big humanist sans serif topography, a uh, total lack of depth, too, um, which is it's actually its biggest criticism, is that since there is no depth, um, interactive elements like fields, buttons, uh, etc., uh, totally lack affordances. So sometimes you're like, is that a button? Is it a label? I have no idea. I won't know until I click on it. Uh, which isn't very good. You know, we should be, as designers, letting people know what they can interact with. Um, and it's something that Google's attempted to solve with its kind of almost flat material design. Uh, and Apple's definitely made steps to improve their uh, design in the past couple releases. So we're also seeing a proliferation of mobile-driven patterns being ported over to the web. Kind of in the past, it was the other way around. You know, we were like, "Oh, mobile is this you know brave new world. Let's just stick the web into it and see what happens." And I think it's it's matured enough to a point now that we're like, "Oh, actually, that's a bad idea." You know, it has its own stuff. And now we're like, "Oh, maybe we can take these mobile ideas and put them on the web." So the most popular uh, mobile to web trend I've seen so far is the use of off-screen menus, aka the hamburger button. I'm sure many of you have seen this on the web and been like, why is this even here? Ah, blah, blah, blah. Um, yeah. So it's used to tuck away navigation menus and supplemental icons, or sorry, items, uh, like widgets, uh, you know, kind of anything you want to like shove aside. Um, and it puts it behind like a panel that, you know, you can either pull up from the top, pull up from the side, uh, when you click on the hamburger button there. Uh, so it's sometimes described as a junk drawer. And if you decide to use it, uh, it's worth tracking clicks before or after implementing to see if your traffic drops off. Because uh, I think sometimes people use it inappropriately. Like, if you have a short menu, you can probably just show your menu. You don't really need to hide it behind another click. So use it wisely, is what I'm suggesting. So, click it, see it open. So another trend that's been gaining momentum largely, uh, I think because of responsive design, are single column sites. Um, so they've been really popular in like startup sites, like tech sites, where like, look at this product, you know, one scrolling page. Um, and it makes layout decisions uh, pretty easy on various screens, because if you only have one column, putting it down to mobile, you're still only going to have one column. But I 
I'm seeing a lot of this uh, actually in theme design in WordPress. This is, I feel like, where it's like you really see a lot of it. So, just one continuous scrolling column.
kind of cool. On an agency site, you know, you could see people who work at the agency like working, and you know, as long as it's like very self-contained and you know very subtle, it, it can create a great atmosphere. You know, it can also bring in a lot of personality, especially when you're careful to optimize everything, so you're not really slowing down your site. Just make sure always to like speed test and you know make sure you're not uh, providing a bad experience. In news and media, we're seeing a lot more design targeted at driving uh, reader engagement. So this includes posting read times, uh, it's kind of so, no, uh, so what people know how long of an article they're getting themselves into. They're like, well, this is a half hour. I'm going to save this for you know tonight when I want to like drink some tea and relax, rather than like right now I have 10 minutes. I'm kind of in between tasks. So it's a trend, uh, as far as I can tell, that was made popular by Medium. You know, I, I think it existed before that. We saw it in other places, but it was really Medium that kind of like brought it out as a thing that, you know, now everybody wants to have their own read times too. And it's actually something we're using on WordPress.com now with the release of our uh, new reader design. We're also seeing uh, progression measurements that keep track of your place in a particular article, which is kind of cool. So if you see here on Bloomberg News, as you scroll down, uh, the article on the top, there's a like bar that shows you uh, where you are in it. It's pretty cool. Um, you know, we're also seeing infinite scrolling of posts. So uh, even your single articles can become a, a list that keeps users reading through your site. Uh, the biggest one is probably ports. You you know maybe like the first place where this was like super popular, but also on uh, Bloomberg Media does it. So you read the article, you're like, oh, cool, oh, hey, here's another article, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I actually have no idea if it's effective or not. Um, I haven't read any sort of data on whether or not it like keeps people engaged. Uh, so if it's something you're thinking about using, you know, uh, as always, a trend is worth testing. So, you know, always be iterating and improving on your designs. So just kind of keep that in mind if you're thinking about applying this to, a, you know, a new site. So lastly, in visual trends, uh, we're really overcoming a lot of the technical constraints that have been limiting our abilities to have full reign over the designs uh, that we produce. So I know that like a lot of people came to web design from a print background, and you know when you're used to print, you're used to having um, a lot, you know, fewer constraints. I mean, you still have the constraints of like you know the kind of ink you're using, you know, the paper you're using, you know, the the method of printing you're going to have, um, but you could use like any font that you want, you know, you didn't have to worry about, like, uh, load time, you know, people, you see a printed thing, you know, that's it. You didn't have to worry necessarily about the context that it was being viewed in, like, you know, I mean, there's nothing you can do to control, like, oh, somebody's trying to read in the dark, but, you know. So we're seeing uh, richer, much more refined typography than we have in the past. There's a lot more that you could do uh, now than you could even a year or two ago. Web type is like super awesome right now. There's a lot of really cool tools, so many new fonts available, uh, so many methods for optimizing. Uh, with things like Flexbox and CSS Columns, uh, which is kind of a new spec, not super well supported right now, but kind of being explored, you know, we're able to create much more complex and asymmetrical grids. If you think back to like the time of tables, trying to make an asymmetrical grid would have been nearly impossible without just like sticking an image on the page. But now we can do a lot more. Like we can do overlap. Uh, we can like put things on top of each other easily and have them resize at a smaller, you know, on smaller screens without totally like messing up our layouts. It's pretty cool. <clears throat> There's just like a lot more now that we can do that we haven't been able to do in the past couple of years. And again, you see, we're seeing a lot of this kind of tile concept. So in the next six months in WordPress specifically, um, I'm expecting at least two things. Uh, first, I think uh, that gradients are making a total comeback. <laughs> they were super popular, you know, way back when, because it was like you could add depth, you know, a lot of like gradients, shadows, whatever, you know, super popular in skeuomorphism. Um, but now, I think they're going to be totally different than they were before. So moreover. Uh, blending from color to color, uh, influenced by the bright palettes of flat and material design. So instead of being used to show depth uh, and then in real life, that, you know, which is kind of how they've been used in the past, they'll be totally decorative, uh, adorning headers, overlaying images, uh, 
That button's a little bit too much, though. You might want to, you know, you might not want to do that. <laughs> but so I actually gave this presentation two weeks ago at WorkKit Montreal, uh, and since then I, I like I've been seeing it everywhere too, especially red, and orange gradients on top of headers, like everywhere. Um, so yeah, I think in the next couple months we're going to be seeing a lot more of it on on WordPress sites. And I think the web has always loved illustration, um, but you know its popularity is kind of like you know waned and waxed. We've been super focused on things like photos and flat colors in the past year or two. Um, that you know, illustration has kind of fallen to the side, except in like really specific cases like Dropbox, who kind of have their entire design aesthetic is built around illustrations. But I think they're actually going to you know make a comeback too. Specifically, I'm expecting to see uh, kind of more of this lo-fi uh, vector illustration uh, that's really popular right now in apps, um, and it's a really good fit for our current flat and material trends. Uh, and actually, since giving this presentation the first time, I saw uh, this Code Academy Summer of Code site using like really bright, like flat material design colors, uh, kind of this you know polygonal uh, vector illustration. So definitely going to see that coming up. I think. One of the things that makes WordPress wonderful is the fact that we have so many themes and so many plugins available, uh, both paid and free. So let's talk a little bit about uh, what we're seeing in theme designs right now. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about responsive design, especially after uh, Matt's great keynote this morning. Um, if you've ever designed a responsive website <laughs> theme, I think, I think you know this feeling of like the constant like, oh, uh, checking. <laughs> so at this point, though, uh, responsive design isn't a trend, it's an expectation. Uh, go responsive or go home. There's really there's no point and making a site or theme right now that isn't responsive. So it's the number one used feature filter in the WordPress server theme directory, uh, leading the second most commonly used filter by 19.1%. That's just the filter, that's not even search keywords there. So this is like, not even a lot of people use the filter UI. So you like go and you like have to click a bunch of things and like it's still way the most popular. I personally feel like it should be checked by default. Like we shouldn't even show you non-responsive design at this point. But that's a track to get for a later time. Responsive themes actually make up 93% of all theme earnings on ThemeForest. Uh, they released this great uh, like exploration into their um, into their like theme ecosystem uh, earlier this year after Pressnomics. Um, so if you check it out, they have a lot of like really cool data that you can look at and like kind of how themes are are going. So they're also becoming increasingly more uh, resolution independent. So you can put a browser on pretty much anything these days, which is a little bit weird. Uh, you know, phones, tablets, cool, TVs, refrigerators, cars, you know, whatever. So at this point, you don't, you don't really know the context in which your site is going to be viewed. You don't know if it's going to be like a crappy Dell monitor from like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, or if it's going to be like a really cool, high-tech, new, super shiny resolution screen. Um, so your site needs to look good, or at least like, okay, uh, on any of those contexts. So what does that really mean? Um, I like to think of it as just vectorize all the things. So um, we're seeing a lot more themes where, like, instead of including including any sort of like, you know, PNGs and backgrounds, um, we're seeing either like it actually works really well with like flat and material because there's no texture, um, but things like uh, decorative graphics, um, maybe not anymore. Uh, icons are all being vectored now. Um, so PNGs really don't cut it, uh, especially. Um, if you're if you're just like you know doing something now, um, if it's not a photograph, uh, you should make a vector. If it is a photograph, it needs to be a photograph. Whatever you can use the awesome responsive image spec to make sure that your images are great looking. Um, but for example, if it's if it's an icon, you can use something like an icon font. Um, super popular right now. Um, been popular for a little while. Font Awesome is the most you know probably the most well known icon font. Um, but truthfully, though, they're a little bit of a hack. You know, instead of letters, you can put together a font file uh, with icon glyphs, and then you can just use it like any other font. Um, but they're rendered like a font, which means that you often have, have some weird, like, anti-aliasing issues, especially when you display an icon uh, outside of its original pixel grid. So if you design an icon on, like, a 16 by 16, uh, 16, by 16 pixel grid, and you want to use it at, like, I don't know, like, 26 pixels, 
it's not going to like render totally clear because it's going to have to like like a font it's going to have to do some weird anti-aliasing so it's it can get a little ugly um, actually chrome has this really terrible bug right now is if you if you change the width of your chrome browser it'll actually like add a weird half pixel to the side of the icon so it's just kind of a, a downfall of icon fonts And when they go wrong, they can kind of go hilariously wrong. Uh, so with a font where the glyph doesn't properly load, it can uh, fall back to something you really didn't intend. So for example, this great uh, four stars and a horse rating on Etsy. <laughs> <laughs> what happened is that their half star just like didn't load, so it fell back to like whatever the browser wanted to put there, which was apparently a horse. <laughs> All of that said, um, there's still a pretty good method for including uh, vector icons in a theme. And there's a bunch of different GPL compatible icon fonts that you can use, like Font Awesome uh, or Generic Fonts, which was built by one of my coworkers. Uh, Filament Group, um, which Matt mentioned earlier, also has a great guide to bulletproofing your icon fonts to avoid, you know, mishaps like four stars and horse. <laughs> Better than icon fonts, though, is SVG. So it's a vector image format native to the web. Uh, honestly, I think they're the future. Inline SVGs are straight up vector. So you don't have any of that like weird anti-aliasing issue. You can actually resize it um, like a true vector. I think they're easier to position. Uh, we've had a lot of problems with WordPress core where we're like, oh okay, I guess we have to like move this like apply like margin top two pixels or like negative two pixels, whatever, to like put it into the context. Uh, SVGs are a little bit easier than that, and you can also still color them with CSS. Um, Unlike icon fonts, though, you can do things like animate individual pieces of them. You can uh, actually go into the SVG code and apply a class. Um, I think Matt demoed that earlier. So, for say, let's say you had like a, a palm tree icon and it had um, a coconut on it. You could actually like apply a class to that coconut and have it like you know rock around and like fall off the tree. So there's a lot of cool opportunities that you have with SVG that you just don't have with icon fonts. You know, the biggest problem right now is fallbacks. Um, um, it's really only like I8 and more, of course, uh, and some early versions of Android. Um, but if you use something like Grunt Icon, Grump Icon, they come with fallbacks, so you don't even need to worry about that. So, as Matt also touched on, a lot of repeat here, uh, the RICG has released a WordPress plugin for uh, responsive images, and if you're a theme builder yourself, you can actually include like several extra functions um, that, to like enhance the experience in your themes. So, um, hopefully, 4.4, we'll see it in core, but uh, I guess we'll know more in the next couple of months. So we're also seeing themes uh, are becoming increasingly more specialized. So Envato, uh, you know, wrote up this great post, Dr. Pressnomics, uh, with a bunch of data from their marketplaces, uh, including Theme Forest, and one of their biggest points was debunking the assumption that theme shoppers want themes that can do it all. Uh, I know, like, the mega themes are really popular, you know, I want my theme to have 10 sliders so I can have a different slider on every page, and like 100 page templates, and like 15 color schemes. Well, apparently, that's, that's not what they're finding anymore. Over 70% of theme forest searches are focused around niche themes. So, uh, this is everything from themes for car dealerships, uh, to construction businesses, to plumbers, um, so, if you are thinking about going into the theme market, it might be worth considering going into something like really small. And instead of trying to have like a do it all, you know, maybe try to do one thing really well. Um, and I think we're going to be seeing, I think, more interesting theme data come out in the next uh, in the next year. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, they're only a security issue when you allow users to upload their own SVGs. 
Uh, so you can like put some malicious code, since you can actually like, I think you can put scripts into SVGs. Um, we don't have a good way of like sanitizing that and checking that when you upload an SVG to your media library. Um, but if you are at, you know, making your own SVGs, using a really popular um, like icon set that SVG, you won't have to worry about that as a security issue because you're actually providing the source. So even if, if you're super paranoid, you can even like open up the SVG in your text editor and see if it has anything weird in it, you know, aside from the like weird native coordinates. Um, but yeah, it's really only an issue with user uploaded content, which is why it's, uh, it hasn't been added to WordPress as something you can upload yet. There's actually a really interesting track ticket about it that's been like super controversial with some people being like, it's a security risk, and other people being like, you know, you can actually mitigate the security risk, blah, 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 blah. Uh, so if it's something you're really into, if you just go onto um, core.track.wordpress.org, I think, uh, you can just search like SVG Media Library and it will come up. Uh, I actually think there are plugins, um, yeah, that will let you um, upload SVGs. So, yes? I see color trends. Color trends, yeah, I actually didn't talk a lot about color trends. Um, I'm seeing a lot of like bright, um, super saturated colors um, that I think are really popular in material and flat. Um, I'm also seeing a lot of pastels, uh, kind of ironically. You know, we're going into this like really bright, saturated, but a lot of uh, newer agency sites, uh, like a, a lot of newer personal portfolio sites I'm seeing are like nice pastel pinks and greens and blues. Um, if you go onto, I wonder if I have internet. So one of my favorite sites uh, to look at um, type is a site called Type Wolf. Um, and they do like a you know site of the day. Uh, it's really it's really about the fonts, um, but it's also great to look for like new inspiration. So like this kind of color over here, like this nice like pale kind of cream, um, this yellow. Again, that yellow. I'm seeing more and more like this. The yellow again. Again, like this kind of like off white yellow cream. I guess a couple pages back, we'll start getting into yeah something like this gray. Yeah, like kind of just like like peachy salmon. I'm seeing a lot of again the yellow. So this is a good site for tight trends. Yeah, it's my favorite site, and if, I think it's like ten dollars, but they have this great um, premium font to free font kind of like matching. Like, what's the closest free font that you can get that like is similar to this premium font? And I like I drop ten dollars on it. It's been like the greatest investment ever. He updates it every month, um, so you get more and more new fonts matching them up with free. Uh, since I work on a lot of products uh, where I don't necessarily have the ability to use premium fonts, it's pretty awesome to be able to be like, yeah, this free font actually looks really cool. <laughs> like, it's not Gotham, but at least it like, looks pretty cool. So, yes? Um, how do you keep up with um, the ever-changing of your So, how do I keep up with everything? Uh, a lot of it's Twitter, actually. Um, pretty much all of my news comes in through Twitter. Uh, I follow a lot of designers, I uh, follow some projects. Um, I read a lot of Alyssa Part. That's probably the only place that I like consistently go to just to like look for new things specifically. Um, go to conferences when I can, you know, work camps are really great. Um, if you, you know, have the budget or if you have a company budget, um, in Event Apart, um, I got to go uh, to Boston earlier this year. Uh, one of the best conferences I've ever gone to. Uh, talked a lot about new cutting edge trends, uh, new tools. Uh, so if that's something you can do, that you know happens in a lot of cities. But um, yeah, a lot of a lot of Twitter, honestly. Any last question? Yes. So I think uh, probably the easiest thing is just using a PNG. Um, if you don't have like a lot of like different. Um, so like one issue we have in WordPress core is that we have all these color schemes. So right now we're looking at converting our uh, icon font and core to SVGs. And one of the issues is uh, same fallbacks. So since we have all these color schemes and the icons are just slightly different, you know, are we like, uh, do we just do like a light and a dark and like call it a day? So you know, that's kind of what we're, what we're doing. Um, but to get fallbacks, you can use something like Grunt Icon, um, if you're using Grunt, or Grump Icon, uh, which is the website with a grumpy unicorn, um, and it, it like converts it to PNG for you, so it's pretty fast, pretty easy, pretty cool. Yes. Okay. So uh, the question is about um, doing some sort of 
testing um, and seeing if things like things still look good on all screens. Um, I know there's a couple sites out there that'll let you do that. Um, I've used Browser Stack before, uh, which is for testing on different browser screens. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a couple different sites out there um, I Google for. I always when I when I work on something myself, I always try to look at it if I can um, on my computer, on my phone, uh, on a tablet, and then I have like an Android tablet that's kind of like a, one of those crappy old ones you would like buy for your like ten year old, um, which is actually one of the most popular tablets out there. Um, so buying yourself like a cheap testing device is also kind of something I'd recommend. Uh, I don't know about like refrigerators or something. I think um, someone like Matt would probably know a little bit better about, about testing. Uh, but in terms of testing uh, for usability, um, I'll use uh, usertesting.com a lot. So if I'm making a new uh, feature uh, and I want to make sure that it, um, it it's you know it actually works pretty well, um, I'll go to usertesting.com, set up a you know a quick uh, a quick test, and uh, it's uh, it's not super expensive. If you have no budget though, you could like I always I definitely call them like my friends to help me test something before. Like hey, can you sit down and like look at this for five minutes? Um, Steve Krug is probably like the, the like master of usability, uh, like usability testing. Um, he has a great, um, a great book, Rocket Surgery Made Easy, which is all about user testing. So if that's something you're interested